Hi, and welcome to this special interview with John Scalzi. I'm Marco Rinaldi. I'm Tarek Ashkenani. Um, uh, we're hosts of uh, Page One, the Writers Podcast, where we like to speak to writers about their writing process and their career. And um, we're really excited to have been invited by Kimira to, to do this interview today. John is obviously one of the USA's top sci-fi authors with a huge and impressive back catalogue of fiction, non-fiction, TV and lots more. Um, won numerous awards and his latest book, uh, The Kaiju Preservation Society, is out now. So we will be asking about that. But before we, before we get to that, I was going to ask, we always start at the very start of your writing journey. And I think I'm right in saying that you grew up reading science fiction and mystery. Um, did you always want to, to be a writer? I always did want to be a writer. I didn't necessarily want to be a novelist or a science fiction novelist. When I was growing up, um, I wanted to be a journalist and a columnist. And uh, so when I went to college and when I did freelance writing, it was all with an eye towards getting to newspapers and doing that sort of thing. And indeed, in my 20s, I worked at a newspaper. I was a film critic and I had an opinion column. Uh, and that was great for a while until here in the United States, newspapers kind of went away uh, mm -hmm. and jobs were uh, harder to find. Uh, and I sort of fell backwards into becoming uh, a full time novelist. I wrote a book. I didn't try to sell it. Uh, it got found on the Internet by my soon to be editor who bought it and bought a second book from me. Um, the first book was Old Man's War. It did reasonably well. And then from then, I've just been doing this. And I know a lot of people uh, kind of hate the fact that I just kind of fell into writing novels. Like it was like, well, oh, that wasn't my plan, but I guess I will do it. Um, <laughs> but in fact, it wasn't my plan. And once it took off, I was like, well, this beats working for a living. Yeah, absolutely. When, when you were working, because I'm, I'm right in saying that you started off working for Chicago Sun Times, etc., right, kind yep. of freelance stories and stuff. And and when you were there before you started doing novels, I mean, you must have learned a lot there in terms of hitting deadlines, editing, oh, getting yeah. back from editors, etc. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, I think having been in journalism was extremely important for being uh, a novelist. One, uh, because although journalism is uh, reporting when not hopefully not making things up um <laughs> you do have to you have to find the narrative thread of your story you have to make it interesting to the people who are uh reading um there is uh, also the matter of being able to hit deadlines um because nobody cares uh about uh whether or not uh, the muse comes the deadline is 3 p.m and if you don't have everything in by then it's too late um, the other thing is that it also means that you have to learn how to write clean copy, right? That it has to be as close to publishable the first time. And I remember that was really hard for me. At one point, uh, a copy editor literally came over and started strangling me because I just made a whole bunch of copy errors that I shouldn't have done. Uh, and I, I took that to heart and I became a little uh, more careful with that. So journalism was actually incredibly important still remains important to me uh as a writer the other thing about working in newspapers as a film critic for years and years um and uh so basically uh watching five to seven movies a week was sort of the equivalent of really intensive story training because you look at the movies you see how they build the story uh and you see what is successful and what's not and when i sat down to start writing um, a lot of the uh, lessons that I learned simply from watching movies and trying to judge which ones were successful and which were not uh, really became helpful in um, building my own stories. A lot of my early books are kind of specifically in a three-act structure. And when, with that first book that you mentioned there that you didn't, you said you didn't try and sell it. And did you put that online was it chapter by chapter i think possibly but yeah um, why why didn't you try and sell that what was the idea behind that oh i i, I was lazy i mean right, that's okay. that's no i mean i wish i had a better i you know thing for that and i and i'm sure at the time i rationalized it uh for some other thing but the fact was 
So Old Man's War, I had written a novel prior to that that was specifically a practice novel to basically mm-hmm. see if I could write a novel. And that uh, was Agent to the Stars. And that ha- I had never intended to sell, right? right? Um, but then Old Man's War, uh, it came to a point where I was like, okay, I should write one that I do intend to sell. Uh, and that was Old Man's War. And so I wrote it. But then when it came down to it, when it was done, um, you know, the whole thing about sending it out, waiting for it to be uh, read and probably rejected and having to send it out again, or possibly uh, trying to get an agent as well during all this time. Uh, basically, I was just like, oh, why? Um, and the thing was, I had, had I, at the time, I had a successful freelance writing career, and I was actually, um, you know, writing nonfiction books at the time. Mm-hmm. So, Uh, The ego gratification of being an author had already happened uh, and I wasn't hard up for cash. Um, And, you know, so as far as it went, it was not uh, a problem for me. I actually just sat on the the um, manuscript for a year uh, because I wrote it in 2001 and then December of of 2002, I just put it up on my website uh, and serialized it a chapter a day. Um, And then uh, you know, and I told people, oh, by the way, if you don't want to wait for each chapter, go ahead and send me a hundred or excuse me, a dollar fifty uh, on this new thing, fangled money system called PayPal. Uh, <laughs> and I'll just I'll just email you the manuscript. Um, and I did that. And then at the end of it, um, I did a uh, just an essay about um, in the things that I'd learned from storytelling. Uh, and then I, uh, you know, and that was the thing that attracted um Patrick Nielsen Hayden to come take a look at that essay and then uh, at the book. And then uh, after he looked at the book, he's like, can I buy that from you? And I was like, sure, you know, why not? I mean, easy for me. Okay. <laughs> Excellent. So, this how, was how, so, so I was just going to ask, how did you find, you know, how, how in the, you know, because you're talking about 2001, how did it find an audience? I was it, was it because you already had a bit of a following from nonfiction, from journalism and things like that? No, what happened was, so I, I, I have a blog um, called Whatever, and I've had the blog since 1998. And uh, so basically what happened was um, I was one of the first um, regularly updating blogs on the internet. I wouldn't say I, I was the first because that would be wrong, um, but I was definitely in that first generation. Um, and because I'd had experience being a columnist and being a journalist and all that sort of stuff, um, it was very similar to that and it had a it had readability. So I had amassed a uh, you know a fair amount of audience mm-hmm. just doing that. Um, so basically, um, it was ba- it was basically one of the first, you know, um, online self-pubbed, uh, books that got out there that made then made the jump into uh, traditional publishing, uh, which I always think is kind of uh, fun because people now uh, talk about traditional publishing versus indie publishing. Uh, and I'm always like, well, back in my day, <laughs> we, we hand rolled our HTML. We didn't have <laughs> movie files, you know, all that sort of stuff. Um, but having that audience uh, for a blog then uh, gave me uh, enough of an audience that I was able to um, basically get uh, that uh, novel scene. And for me, like I said, because uh, I was already doing other sorts of writing, um, that was that was actually enough for me. When I put it up, I didn't put it up with the intent of somebody will find it, right? I put it up with the intent of this is where this thing is going to live now until yeah. it dies. Yeah. Um, or I get bored and I pull down the website. Um, and now, of course, you know, it's 2022. Uh, the website has been up for 23 and a half years. And so I haven't got bored with it yet. <laughs> and what's your process say, when it comes to writing? Because when, you know, looking back at something like that, which you're putting out a chapter at, at a time, did you have a plan for the whole book? Or were you putting out a chapter and then it was kind of locked in because it was out there and you couldn't go back and edit it? You had to stick with it. And has that process changed now? Um, no, I mean, the Old Man's War, I think between the version that put up, I put up on my website and the version that eventually got published, I think three sentences changed. 
right? Okay. Uh, there wasn't that much of a there wasn't that much of a difference. Um, I mean, it was complete when it was done, and this is part and parcel again about having been a journalist and having yeah. the clean copy. Um, but also, you know, here's the thing: I started writing um, creatively um, the same year as the first uh, Macintosh computer came out. So I've always, I've never really worked on typewriters. I never wrote longhand. I always wrote on computer. And when you write on a computer, um, you can edit as you go along. There's lots of people who will do a draft and then they will go back and they'll tweak mm -hmm. and they'll rewrite and all that sort of stuff. Um, but again, and this is a recurring theme, I am lazy and the idea of doing an entire draft and then having to go and massively rewrite because anytime you change something significantly in chapter three, it will ripple through for the rest of it. Uh, I would just rather sort of edit as I, as I go along. So by the time that I get to the end of what I'm writing, and I can just send it off to my, uh, my editor like 10 minutes later. And so basically that's been my process, but, but in seat, um, start writing. I make it up as I go along. I don't usually outline. Um, and then um, edit as I go along. Like every morning I will wake up and I will read the pages of the stuff that I wrote the day before. I'll tweak and edit and tighten up and then I'll start writing um, the next bit. And I usually do 2000 words a day or from 8 a.m. till noon, whichever comes first. Right. Um, and if I get more than 2000 words, that's great, but I don't really kill myself for it. And if I get less than 2000 words, well, that means my brain's working through something. Um, and that's basically been um, the process for the last dozen years. I think before that, I did more of uh, writing on weekends, and I would write like 8,000 words or 6,000 words. Um, and then I would, uh, you know, think about what I would do next for the next week or so, and then do it again. That's kind of how I wrote Old Man's War. Um, but I found that as, as I get older, uh, my brain is less resilient and writing 8,000 words a day is um, not great. Um, <laughs> so writing that 2,000 words a day, which is a uh, sort of clip that I can handle. Um, and again, that's where journalism uh, really has come in handy. Um, and then when I'm done with that, my brain doesn't feel like it's been completely deflated. I can think a little bit about what I want to write the next day. Um, and uh, so that is a reasonable uh, sort of uh, schedule for me. And does does that process of, you know, editing as you go and presumably ending up with what you think is a fairly clean draft, does that yeah. mean that when you send it into um, editors and stuff like that, you're not having to come back and redraft and do significant redrafts and things like that? No, I mean, I think that's, that's correct. I mean, in the, in the time so I've written like what, 16 novels or something. I think in that time I've had four pages of notes. Right. Um, oh, yeah. Um, and again, this is why a lot of people want to push me in front of a train. But, <laughs> um, but, the, but the thing about it is, um, I mean, I wish I could say anything uh, other than that's just the way that my brain works. You know, if I find a flaw, I deal with it immediately. If I'm bored with what I write, um, then I pull it out immediately. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, I, I think I want to be very, very clear because it sound, makes it sound like, you know, it's just like, oh, he gets through it. He doesn't think about it anymore. Off it goes. Um, no, I'm merciless with my own writing. I'm, as a reader, I get bored super easily. And uh, the person's writing that I get the most bored with is my own, right? And so if I'm not entertaining myself or if I'm not clipping along mm -hmm. as I should, um, the idea that anybody else would be interested in that um, is nonsense. And so I just immediately pull, pull that out. Um, so there is, you know, I want to emphasize, there is quite a lot of editing. Um, there is quite a lot of tweaking. There is quite a, there are times where I'm pretty sure the, the novel is going to go in a particular direction and all of a sudden it goes in a different direction and a better direction. And I just go with that. Um, so I would say that I probably do the same amount of editing uh, and the same amount of tweaking as uh, other writers do. Um, I just do it all uh, during and, the process. Yeah. And yeah. during during the process itself. And one result of that is again, um, fairly clean copy. But also the other the other aspect of it is, I mean, I'm pretty sure that uh, Patrick Nielsen Hayden, who is my uh, editor, I think early on uh, we both 
understood that, you know, uh, I don't need a whole lot of handholding on the editing front. There are writers I know who turn in a draft and they're basically begging their editors yeah. to rip it apart and help them put it, put it back together. And that is a hundred percent valid way to do it. Um, but that's basic, not basically the way that I do it. There have been times where Patrick was like, you need to fix this. And I have absolutely fixed it. I don't, my ego is not residing in the idea that I never need notes. The, on that path is a very bad path yeah. for a writer to go. Um, but um, most of the things that I think that he would have a problem with, I've anticipated and I've already rooted out um, before it gets to him so that when he gets it, most of what he has been asking me to do um, has been smaller uh, tweaks. Those are important tweaks. You know, Patrick is a genuinely good editor. And when he asks me to make changes, those changes have a significant impact on the novel. Um, but he doesn't, uh, he doesn't insert himself just to insert himself. Yeah, he is, yeah. you know, he's the sort of editor who's like, you know what you're doing, and I know you know what you're doing, so go do what you're doing. Nice. Uh, now, the Kaiju Preservation Society is your latest book, uh, which um, I believe you as a copy of it right there. And yep. I, I'm right in saying that you wrote it in two months after you abandoned another novel. So tell us all yep. about how the writing of that came about and what the book's about itself. So uh, the, the book is about, as I like to tell people, it's about friendship. It's about science. Um, it's about 150 meter large creatures um, and occasionally about nuclear explosions. What more, what more could That's you want out of it? Pithy summary, yeah. <laughs> uh, the, the thing about the book is it was, um, yeah, it took me, I wrote it in five weeks. And the, um, but wow. it was at the end of a process where I was trying to write a completely different book in 2020 and I just wasn't able to make it work. Um, the book I was trying to write, uh, the way that I explained it to people was, it was Das Boot in Space. And then oh. for everyone who is, under the age of 50, the way they explain it is it's a dark, gritty, um, claustrophobic political thriller in space. Uh, and it turns out that 2020 was a really awful time to try to write something dark, moody, political, gritty, <laughs> claustrophobic. Or you, yeah, exactly. <laughs> in, in space or not, right? Um, and so, um, you know, so I was having difficulty writing it simply just because it was not pleasurable to write during a difficult year. Uh, but not only that, um, most of the time having previously been a journalist ha has been a blessing. Um, but one of the flip sides uh, of that was I find it very, very difficult um, to filter out the world, right? Um, because so much of my early, early training was find out what's happening in the world, form an opinion about it, write it for your call, right? Um, and 2020 was just, it was just one fire after another. Uh, and it was really difficult for me to turn away from that and to get into a mind space of, okay, I'm going to completely block that out and off we go. Um, and then at the end of the year, um, November and December, um, I got sick and I don't, and the blood tests and the nasal swabs and everything else say it wasn't COVID, but whatever it was, it was just fuzzing up my brain. I just couldn't formulate thoughts um, that were of any complexity at all. And um, so that took a couple of months right out of my schedule there. And then I tried to get back to writing the new thing uh, or the previous book. Uh, so I started on January 4th, which was the first Monday um, of, the, of the year. Um, and I wrote 250 words. And the next day I wrote 500 words. I was like, okay, this is good progress. And then January 6th happened. And I don't know if everybody in the UK remembers what happened here in the United States on January 6th, but we had a coup or an attempted coup. <laughs> it didn't take, fortunately, but at that point I was just like, I'm not writing another damn thing until January 20th, which was the inauguration. And then once the inauguration happened, uh, I was like, I'm going to give it another week to 10 days just to be sure, you know, <laughs> make sure it sticks. Make sure it sticks. And by that point, um, you know, it just, it, it was becoming progressively clear that this thing wasn't working. And I finally had to say to Patrick, it's not working and I've been trying to make it work uh, and I just can't make it work. And this was the first time in 16 books um, that I'd ever 
said that. I would, I have always been able to get a book in at the deadline, right? I might be at 7 a.m. on the morning of the deadline, but it was still on the deadline. Um, and this time I just absolutely couldn't. And fortunately, Patrick was like, I lived through 2020. I understand. We will figure out something. I went to go take a shower. As when I went to go take a shower, my brain was like, oh yeah. So, hey, remember that book that you were never going to finish writing anyway? Well, I was thinking of a completely different book and it's called the you know, Kaiju Preservation Society. And here it is. And literally just the whole thing downloaded into my brain, right? Like, you know, whatever my subconscious had been doing for months just came evident. And I immediately got out of the shower. I, uh, I went to uh, the computer and I basically said to Patrick, it's like, hey, remember how I said I wasn't going to have a book? Give me, give me six weeks, you'll have a book. And I got it to him in five. <laughs> but you know, and people concentrate on the fact that it's like you wrote a novel in five weeks. And I was like, no, I wrote a novel in five weeks after I had an entire year of not writing a novel. I would much rather go through my usual process where it takes three or four months to write a book than to have ground my gears for an entire year and then wrote a, a novel, not in a panic, but certainly in a rush um, in, in five weeks. And now I'm extremely happy with Kaiju. I think it's a wonderful book. And it was exactly the book I needed to write after an extremely difficult year, right? Um, but uh, all things being equal, um, I prefer a predictable uh, writing process over what I had. And yeah, I, I'm, I'm reading it right now. I think you've described it as a, as a sort of pop song of a novel, which I think is a great description of it. It's just, uh, you know, really fun read and really quick and easy sure. read as well. So, yeah, really enjoying it. Highly recommend it to everyone. Um, and we wanted to ask as well about your work out with novels as well, because um, you, you've you obviously worked in TV as well. You were a consultant on Stargate Universe. Um, sure. You've had stories adapted for... Uh, love death and robots and netflix um yeah. how does that stuff come about and what's your approach to that sort of work in most cases um what happens is um a producer or a director or somebody involved with film and tv goes to my manager and says hey is this book available or the story available for optioning and then we find out whether or not they are serious which is always a um you know which is always a thing um and then if we decide they're serious and we decide that we want to do business with them and then we go on to the next uh step i've been very very fortunate um for a, a couple of reasons the first being um that my books for whatever reason have sold well enough um that basically whenever one comes out uh, it comes to the attention of people and they look at it um, so we have quite a lot of stuff that is optioned, uh, and is under option at any one time. Um, but the other aspect of it, I think is simply part of my philosophy of where my role, what my role is in science fiction, fantasy literature, and how that relates to, uh, what gets optioned and, and what's not. Um, basically, you know, I, part of, part of the reason that I, uh, that I think I've sold reasonably well and why Tor has given me uh, a 13 book contract, which they did in 2015, um, is that I think everybody understands that my role is to be, to write approachable science fiction, which is science fiction that you can, uh, if you've been reading science fiction for 20, 30 years, you're like, yes, okay, it's, this is obviously science fiction. Uh, but for the folks who have been reluctant to pick up a science fiction book, even though they watch all the Star Wars movies and all the MCU uh, movies and watch uh, Stranger Things on TV and whatnot, um, but they've been reluctant to pick up a book. Um, part of my job is to write the books that are easy for the people uh, who haven't read science fiction uh, before to get a grip on and, and uh, sort of build, uh, build into uh, the genre. And because that's sort of what I do, you know, that my role is to write easily approachable science fiction. Um, when it comes to um, creating stuff that is optionable, uh, that the that they can basic that you can basically 
uh, understand what it is in a sentence or less. Mm -hmm. um, it's like when you need really simple explanations of what you've written, you come to <laughs> Spalzi. Um, and I think that that makes a huge difference in terms of, of what I do. And also, you know, like I said, having been a film critic and then thus writing uh, books that had that sort of cinematic feel to them simply because that was the story model that I was seeing literally every day for uh, for years and years um, certainly had an impact as well. So I think that's one of the reasons why uh, Hollywood uh, has come to me as often as they have for optioning. Um, you know, and then of course the the real question is: Yes, you can get optioned. Are they actually ever going to make something of yeah. yours? And fortunately, they've started to with Love, Death, and Robots, um, with the third season of which is going to be out on May 20th on Netflix. Um, so that's great. Um, and then hopefully some other stuff that we have options will also uh, start to see the light of day. Do, do you think the streaming services like Netflix and Amazon and stuff have created more opportunities for writers to get their work made in that way? Uh, yes, absolutely, because the uh, streaming services just basically expanded the marketplace, right? Uh, it used to be, here in the United States at least, it used to be three, then four major networks, uh, and then uh, five or six movie companies, and that was you know, mm -hmm. what you had to work with. And then uh, HBO and the other basic cable channels here in the United States um, started doing original material as well, and that began to expand. Um, but then when you got the streaming, the streaming is just an uh, insatiable mall. There's always something, there always has to be something yeah. uh, that's coming out. And this is both good and bad. I mean, it's good because uh, this very instant is a golden age and, and writers getting things optioned because there's, there's a huge rush to get anything that you might be able to make into a, a series or a movie or whatever. Um, the flip side of it is it makes it more difficult for anything that gets optioned to grab the attention of people. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so, um, you know, it, it used to be, you know, it's like now a major motion picture, you know, or something like that. And uh, now it is one of 17 things that are coming out on Netflix, <laughs> right. Yeah. right? So, you know, that is, that is the marketplace. Now, and the thing is, is that also, um, I think that we have reached peak streaming at this point um, and uh, that we are now going to probably start seeing a little bit of consolidation. I mean, we've seen the, the panicked reports of mm -hmm. Netflix losing 200,000 subscribers. They have 200 million, you know, uh, but, you know, they have to go from an acquisition model, right, to a retention model now. Um, and then um, eventually some of these streaming services are going to go yeah. away consolidate or something like that and the number of things that get optioned um is gonna is gonna drop so to everyone who's gotten something optioned in the last couple of years good job uh <laughs> you know i think it's going to get uh more difficult for all of us um going going forward but that is that is the nature of of the beast so to speak yeah. so so what's next then what's next on your plate what have you got coming out soon or what you're working on um so what i'm i'm currently working on another novel i'm always currently working on another novel um and i can't talk about what that um novel is going to be yet um uh, because um i'm still i'm still in the process of writing it i will say that having written kaiju um i and patrick and the other people at tour kind of looked at it and were like we like this vibe why don't we do some more vibe in that you know it's something Ooh, in yeah. that same vibe for the next book so i think the next book will be it's not the same subject it's not necessarily the same universe but i think uh the people who have enjoyed kaiju will probably like the next book as well um beyond that um over at audible i have the third dispatcher installment and that's going to come out sometime reasonably soon i don't know uh yet they haven't nailed down the uh, debut day of that but um hopefully in the second half of the year uh like i said love death and robots uh the new season comes out on may 20th in the united states and i think everywhere else in the world because netflix is global and i have uh a uh episode in that called three robots exit strategies which i think will be fun for everyone and then 
we have other stuff that's in process. Well, Men's Wars at Netflix, it's being developed. Other stuff is uh, other places. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to make some interesting announcements about that stuff soon. And, um, and then once I turn in the new novel, I plan to play video games all summer long. Honestly, that sounds like a good that's, plan. That's my plan. Yeah. <laughs> like I'm a 53 year old man and I play video games. Yeah. It's cool. the dream. It's the dream. Um, it well, it, before, before we go, one last question we were going to ask you, which uh, given that you've written the Kaiju Preservation Society, we thought you will be the definitive answer on this Godzilla mm-hmm. or Kong who wins? Godzilla or Kong who wins? Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, at the end of the day, one of them has nuclear breath and the other <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. right? I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm team mammal all the way, right? You know, you gotta you gotta stick up for your primates, your primate pals, even if they're you know hundred meters tall. Um, but I mean, come on, nuclear breath, uh, really top hide. It's hard not to put money on Godzilla, right? And so my feeling is at the end of the day, if it came down to it, that's that's where I would go. And it would kill me because like I said, you know, you know, team team mammal all the way. But <laughs> I mean there's there's the heart, which is Kong, <laughs> and then there's the wallet that goes to the bookie and that goes Godzilla. <laughs> yeah. Great, right, right. Well uh, thanks very much, Jordan. That was a lot of fun. That was fantastic. Welcome. Thanks for having me.